Hello, and welcome to our podcast on how to read charts, graphs, maps, and tables. This is one of those great interdisciplinary skills that apply to both the social science and the English side of our classroom as we are incorporating nonfiction reading skills, chart reading skills, and then being able to apply those to governmental or economics topics. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. So first off, what are we considering charts, graphs, tables, etc.? cetera? Uh, their most primitive definition is the idea of the plotting of data points in various formats. So this goes back to elementary school, all the different types of graphs you may have seen in science, math classes, social science classes, etc. line graphs, bar graphs, pie charts, just different ways of showing numerical data. Also, we will be looking at maps and how those are important. Uh, basically, various types of representations of the Earth. These could be political. So we do have political lines, such as country outlines, state outlines, provinces, cities, counties, etc. We might also have geographical, and so that could just be based on where a mountain is, where lakes are, rivers, etc. And then the thing we're going to be seeing the most of are what are called subject-specific maps. So the idea of how does this map overlay with various governmental issues? How does this overlay with economic issues? Why is reading charts, graphs, or tables important? Our world has expanded to include many more visual items. While we might love to read magazines, newspapers, books, things like that, the world we are living in now is increasingly visual and so much information is presented that way. So we should probably be able to read and interpret all of these visual things that are being thrown at us that have been embedded in all of the print reading that we are doing. So something to keep in mind as we get into this is, do these texts have biases? And the short answer is yes, all texts have a bias. And so we do have other podcasts on things like the OPVL structure or the CRAP test, which are various structures that we as readers can use to apply to these texts to start to pick them apart and look at where they're coming from, who created them, why they created them, what their purpose might have been in making these texts, and therefore what bias does each text have. So how do we read these texts? Here are some steps that we've come up with as instructors. They may not be the end-all be-all perfect steps to take, but we figure if you come across a chart, map, table, etc., and apply these steps, you'll have a good handle on how to read them, how to learn from them, and how they can be used for further investigation. So the first step, and this goes with reading pretty much anything, is that we have to set aside our own biases. We have to set aside what we may want data to show, and we have to read the text for what it does show. Oftentimes in this world of hyper-partisanship where people are very left or very right, very Republican, very Democrat, it's like you can never see the other side of any aisle. People are reading into these graphs what's called confirmation bias. Basically, they're, they're staking out a position like, hey, A, B, or C, is really good. And then they're finding a graph and they're saying, hey, look, this graph shows that I'm right. I knew it all along. Nobody could have persuaded me, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Sometimes we're going to have something in our mind and the charts will support what we've already been thinking. But sometimes those charts are going to show something else. And so we have to set aside those biases, agree to examine the chart in an open-minded manner, and pledge to read that in the most bias-free manner that we can muster. Number two, we're gonna note the chart's publishing source and then try to figure out its bias as we try to delve into the information. So who created this chart? Is that a person? Is that a group? Was that a website? Was that a special interest group? From there, once we've identified who even made it, we have to ask ourselves, what is that source's traditional bias? And as we get more and more practice at looking at sources, we can typically pick apart a source and say, well, wait a second, I know that if it's coming from this source, it's going to be very biased toward X, Y, or Z. If I know it's coming from this source, I know it's going to be biased against X, Y, or Z. 
And then we have to ask ourselves what data is actually being presented. Is the data presented being slanted by its source bias? Or is the data presented just numerical? Is it as bias free as possible? Again, nothing is perfectly bias free, but some things are going to be less biased. Some are going to be more biased. And we as readers and learners and researchers have to understand what we're being presented with. And so as we talk about sources and sources, traditional biases, this image is often something we go back to. And feel free to stop the podcast and explore it a little bit. It's something we've used in class, but you may want to slow this down a little bit and kind of see where typical sources that you use are located on this. So for example, here we have a graph. Its title is police are more likely to be killed in homicides in states with more guns. Okay, it gives us a scale, but then let's go down to the source. That's kind of what we're working on here. Over on the bottom right, it tells us that this was published by Vox, so an online publication source. And if you go back to our overarching source bias grid, you could find where Vox is. And you can see that Vox leans left and is kind of in the upper left-hand quadrant where it has complex analysis or a mix of fact reporting and analysis. So maybe you're saying to yourself, well, wait a second, Vox is too left-leaning for this to be credible. But look at the original source of the information. It's not Vox. It actually comes from the firearm prevalence and homicides of law enforcement officers in the United States. So some sort of empirical science-based research study on these gun statistics. So while Vox may be left-leaning, we'd also want to investigate the bias of the firearm prevalence and homicides, et cetera, what their research bias is. So once we figured out where it's from, number three, we wanna read the chart's title. What data is the chart actually showing? What is it not showing? Additionally, is this absolute data, meaning data that observes a point in time. So in 1996, 15 people were driving school buses. That tells us absolute data. It just says at this point, this is how many things were happening. Or does this chart give us what's called change or relative data? So is it pointing out a trend? Is it pointing out a change? For example, hey, between 1995 and 2005, 20,000 more people began driving buses. That doesn't mean 20,000 people were driving buses. It means 20,000 people more were joining the ranks of bus drivers. And so we have to be very clear about what we're reading. Number four, it's wise for us to examine the time frame of the chart. So what year or years does the chart cover? Hopefully that's in the title or in some of the axes. So we'd wanna look at the context of the chart. If this chart is happening in a certain year, well, what was going on historically then? what was going on politically, economically, and socially. So again, cross-referencing or tying in interdisciplinary questions from government, from economics, from history class, all giving us the good background we might need to be able to interpret a graph, chart, or a map. Then we need to start plotting out exactly what does this chart say. So logically, we want to look at that X or that horizontal axis first. That's going to be your independent variable. So it just kind of moves on regardless of influence. So usually that's time. And then we're going to look at the Y or the vertical axis, so the up and down axis, and what does it represent? We're gonna look at any keys or legends or color coding, and then ask ourselves what data is the chart actually reporting? At this point, we're not trying to interpret, we're not trying to think deeply about, we're just trying to gather what is this chart actually saying on a literal level. So step six, we have to look at those absolute and then trend data patterns. Look at absolute data. In what year did something happen? Can we find an exact date? But then also look at the trends. Where does this graph or chart show change? Where is the data improving? Where is the data worsening? Just because something goes up and to the right does not necessarily mean that it is better. Oftentimes we think that, hey, it goes up and to the right. Up and to the right is always good. Well, not necessarily. It depends on what the key or the legend or the data is actually telling us. But we wanna be able to look next at what is absolutely reported and what patterns are being reported.
Step number seven, we're gonna make connections. What do we already know? What historical or political or economic, social overlays can be placed on this? Was there a major world event that was covered in this graph? Maybe who was president? Who was in control of Congress? Where were we in the business cycle, which is a typical up and down pattern we see in economies around the world? Was this a time of more liberal or more conservative ideas? Again, we're inching closer toward interpretation, but we're now connecting what we are literally reading with what we know from our background knowledge. And again, the more you know in terms of background knowledge, the more things you've read or seen or experienced, all add into your background knowledge stores and will help make making connections easier for you. So step eight is where we need to interpret the chart. We have to take what we are literally seeing and try to connect that with our background knowledge and try to figure out the so what of this particular chart. What is this chart really telling us about some data points, about America, about history, government, economic, social issues, etc.? Now here are two big words that we might be able to interpret with our charts. Can we interpret some sort of causation where one event causes another event. So for example, if we see a graph that shows temperatures get colder starting in October, and at the same time, the amount of people buying winter coats and hats and gloves goes up, we can probably determine causation. Colder weather caused people to buy warmer clothing. We can also interpret the chart and maybe we just see correlation where events have a relationship or some sort of connection. And so we look at our X and our Y axis and we see that these plot points are going up and down together. Now maybe A caused B, maybe they're just rising and falling at the same rate yet are completely unconnected. So just because we see correlation things rising and falling at a certain rate does not necessarily mean we can instantly interpret causation. Maybe A caused B, or maybe A and B are just moving independently because of what they are, and they've just been graphed in an awkward way. This is where we have to think critically about what we're presented with. For example, here is a graph showing the years 1900 to about 2010, and then the vertical axis per capita cigarette consumption. You can see that the blue graph shows that the peak was in about 1960 something. Americans were smoking a lot of cigarettes. And about 20 years later, we have a similar peak in the number of lung cancer deaths. Is there correlation between these two variables? Yes, they both rise and kind of fall at the same rate. Is there causation? Did the number of cigarettes smoked probably cause many if not all of the lung cancer cases? Yeah, probably. We might be able to interpret that. Are there always exceptions? Sure, there are people who get lung cancer who have never smoked a cigarette or used tobacco in their lives. But according to this graph, is there correlation? Yes, they mirror each other. Is there causation? Probably. Here's one more here, a little bit more goofy. Number of people who drowned by falling into a pool is in red. And then the films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in, that is in black. Fine, we can see years across the bottom, number of drownings on the left, number of films Nicolas Cage has been in on the right. Is there correlation? There is. As he is in more movies, more people have died in swimming pool drownings. But is there causation? Did the number of films he was in cause more people to drown? Or... Did more people drowning cause Nicolas Cage to be more active as an actor and get into more films? That is unlikely. So again, as we are interpreting and trying to figure out that interpretive level of our charts, we have to talk about those ideas of correlation and causation. Here's a great example. Correlation, yes, they do correlate. They do go up and down relatively closely together. But did one cause the other? Probably not. And so the last point, and I know you're not going to go through every single one of these steps on every single graph, but as you get more practiced at them, you will do these intermediate steps more quickly and just integrate them into your thinking. Number nine is we're going to draw some final conclusions. Okay, what did this graph show us? What did it not show us? What did we learn? What can we interpret as correlation or causation? What data can we pull out of this? And then this is where we have to apply this into our essay. 
or our argument or whatever we are doing while we are reading this graph. If we're going to argue that A caused B and we have a graph to prove it, you're going to have to explain that. If you're going to argue that A had zero connection with B, just happened to be there at the same time, fine. Explain that at this point. Draw conclusions, put a final pin in it, and wrap up the entire analysis of that chart, graph, table, or map. So that's about it in terms of how to read charts, graphs, maps, and tables. You may have other steps that you are doing, but if you struggle with this, slow the pace, try to take these steps one at a time, and really work methodically through any chart, map, or graph you are given. And that will give you a fighting chance to figure out what's it saying, what is its bias, where is it coming from? What does it show and not show? And then how can I use this and learn from it? That's what we're trying to get us to be able to do through this podcast. As always, if you have any questions, please bring those into class. We'd be more than happy to answer them. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon.